So people have said before uh, on this great commandment, it's a twofold commandment, and it's a cruciform commandment, which means there's this vertical aspect and horizontal aspect. And just important to be reminded of that, that we can only love our neighbor as ourself from the strength that comes from God. So we have to go to God, and we have to be able to spend time in his presence, to allow him to um, romance our soul. So then it then bubbles over in a life-giving love for our neighbor. But we can only say that we really love God if we actually are willing to love his family. St. James would mention that of saying, what good is it to say, you know, something like, God, God bless you, keep warm, all these things, but then you just walk away from the person and you don't help that person. St. James would say, faith without works is, is dead. It doesn't have a soul. And so remember that our love of God has to carry over in how we treat one another. St. Augustine would very beautifully take this and challenge his congregation when he would say, as you see the host lifted up and you hear the word, the body of Christ, and, and before you say amen, he says, look around and recognize that as you say amen to the head, you're also saying amen to the whole body. And that's where Christ himself would even say, if you have something against your neighbor and you, you remember it and as you bring up your, your gift, your offering, in a sense, as you're getting ready for communion in our context, um, says, well, leave your gift at the altar. Go and reconcile yourself with that person and then come. And so this idea of in order for us to truly enter into the mystery of communion, it's not just God and me, but we are saved together. Each of us will give that individual accounting, but we're also so related to one another that it's not merely just me and God, and it doesn't really matter what happens to everyone else, but, but that we are all intertwined, so connected. You can even think of those that are called to the monastic life, like St. Bernard, their prayers in which our world says that this is a waste, they should do something useful with their time, they're just sitting around praying, and yet they're the very ones that are keeping our world together by their, this beautiful offering of their whole lives, praying for the world, praying for you. And maybe quite possibly when you get to heaven, you'll meet that monk, that nun, who you never knew of, who was on the other side of the world, and yet their prayers helped you be able to say yes in that original grace of conversion. We have no idea how connected we are. And yet also we have the negative aspect, and we, we know that so well that when someone doesn't live their life for God or doesn't love their neighbor as themselves, it becomes the the, the Antichrist. It becomes the opposite of Christ. To be like Christ is to allow the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon you because Christ, that word means like chrism, it means anointed. And Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit empower him for his mission. And the Lord wants to do the same with us. And yet if we don't love God, and if we don't love our neighbor, then we're in a sense taking, in a certain sense, taking that chrismatic oil and flinging it aside. And then it becomes the opposite witness. And we know just from whether different leaders in the church, different priests, different scandals, different things like that, um, families, parents, all of those that we look up to in different ways, how, how wounded we can be when someone who is called to be 
that image of the Father, the image of love, don't live out that, that vocation, that witness. And it trickles down and has so many different roots of wounds. So we're connected both in the, the virtue and the vice, the good and the bad. And so the Lord is saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. One could see in the first reading today how this is played out. Because you have Naomi and her daughter-in-law is Ruth. Ruth is not Jewish. She's not part of Israel. She's a Moabite, which were at certain times enemies of Israel. And yet Ruth marries into Naomi's family. Ruth's husband dies. The other, her sister-in-law, Ophrah, that's actually where we get Oprah from, the name, but Ophrah, um, her husband dies as well. And so um, their mother-in-law's husband dies. And so they're in this, this moment of immense pain. Imagine all of their husbands pass away. They don't have anyone to take care of them, especially in this, in this particular world in which the men of the household really were the ones who became the, the protectors and also the, the breadwinners. And without that, there's no social security, there's, no, there's, no, there's so many things that they don't have and they're very defenseless and yet they, they band together and they're, they're trying to struggle through this time of, of terrible famine. And finally, Naomi says, daughters, go, go back, daughters-in-law, go back to your own people as I go back to my people. And one of them, Ophra, says she does go. But Ruth clings to Naomi and says these beautiful words. She says, don't ask me to abandon you or forsake you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. How is she able to say that? From the witness of Naomi, a mother-in-law that loved God, loved her neighbor. And there was something, we don't know all the context there, but it was enough that Ruth didn't really even know the God of Israel just yet. But she knew Naomi and knew Naomi's witness that there was something very, very special about Naomi's God. And she was willing to leave everything else because of what she saw in her mother-in-law. And then later on, she discovers more and more the God of Israel but it starts with that witness of her mother-in-law. That's how so many moments of conversion, moments of growing in the faith, evangelization, it happens through that witness of how you live your life in your words and in your deeds. And so to think about how is the Lord calling you to be like a Naomi? So that someone could look at you and say, whatever you have, I want. Whatever is special in your life is special for me. And whoever you're worshiping, I want to bow down and worship. So we have to look and say, well, who are we worshiping? Are we worshiping the right God? Or are we worshiping maybe a version of that God that we've sort of put out there that's comfortable to work with? Or are we truly bowing down before the mystery of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who revealed himself definitively in our Lord Jesus Christ? And it's only through the Holy Spirit that has been given to you in baptism that wants to come alive in your, in your life that you can actually see Jesus for who he is. And then Jesus leads you to the Father. 
And as you gaze upon the Father, you become a magnet for so many other people who look at you and see the glory of God shining on your face, just as it shined on Moses and was glowing forth. But now that veil has been removed, and people will look at you and they will say, what you have, I want. I remember this actually happened to me in high school, where I had a... um, uh, a, young, a young woman, a peer of mine, who was one of my fellow singers. Her name was Crystal, and she didn't believe in God or, or anything like that. But I remember at the very end of my senior year, she, she took me aside and said, where is that joy coming from in your heart? I want what you have. And I was able to open up and say, it actually comes from Jesus. He's the one that gives me my joy. She kind of stopped for a second because she wasn't expecting that. I was at a public high school. She was like, okay. And I don't know exactly what happened after that, but I know that there was a moment in which something clicked in her heart. She saw joy and she wanted that. But then the Lord was able to help me to speak that out and say, you know, well, I'm just being a good person, stuff like that. No, it's speaking the gospel in that moment and saying, actually, that joy, that you want, that's, that's connecting with your heart, is actually the Lord Jesus Christ who wants a relationship with you. That's what we need to do. Actions, words. Witness, proclamation. In the Holy Spirit, that's what the first apostles did. And that's what Jesus commands us to do as well. Go and make disciples of all nations.